things, and it has the effect in us on the church. Uh, and the effect on us as pastors, oh my goodness. Some of you saw the messenger group this morning, uh, the little funny thing I put up, and about the reality of uh, looking out and seeing people on a Sunday when the time changes, <laughs> how it can change the service. But God is able, praise the Lord, and we're here and we're able to give him the praise and the honor and the glory in his name. And praise God, we're getting more light. Hallelujah. Amen. And even tonight when we have our discipleship time, there'll be light when you come to the church. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, I don't know, Marvin, you were in NYC 99? Yeah, doesn't that make you feel old? <laughs> I'm looking at it thinking, do you know that was 25 years ago? I know, I was last year. <laughs> uh, I say that because two of the gentlemen in in that song, Joy, 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 there, uh, are from the band Delirious. And man, they were powerful in 99, right? And, and I was just like, praise the Lord. 25 years later, still they're, still, they're still doing it and still praising the Lord. But it didn't make me feel old today. <laughs> 25 years ago, I find that hard to believe. Doesn't matter where we are in our lives, God is good all the time. And that that rhythm in that song made me think a little bit about Africa today. And we're in this, there was a little bit of that African beat in there. And so we're kind of, it's it's a smorgasbord of a service today. Uh, we're doing a little bit of everything today because God is worthy. And we're going to hear a good report from the trip from Malawi. Uh, you know, I would feel, I'm really feeling sorry for those that missed the service today, because I believe it's, it's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord, and as every Sunday is, but I'm just sensing that God is wanting to do something great in this place today. Uh, just to give you a heads up, there is discipleship gathering this evening, and uh, 6.30 p.m. we have our coffee time. Don't bring anything for coffee time because we've been blessed with things from yesterday, refreshments. So just, I'm going to put the coffee pot on. And so come at 6.30 for fellowship and at 7 o'clock we'll have our discipleship gathering. We'd love to see you. Uh, just put in your calendar the reminder, family gym night is March 15th. And so that's, uh, that's coming up on us here in March 15th, family gym night at the boys school. That's for everyone to come and be a part of that. Uh, it takes the place of our youth night. Youth are invited to be a part of that. And there's always uh, some good basketball and things happening. The kids do all kinds of stuff and have fun in the gym. And uh, I noticed last time there was even some pickleball. So there could be some, hey, you want to bring a crocodile board and have a little healthy competition? Go for it. It'll be a great time to get together for fellowship. The seniors have moved their sing song time to March 28th at 6.30 p.m. at Leighton and Marty's. And it'll uh, be a great time to come out, great fellowship. Always lots of food, great fellowship, and a time to sing together and have uh, there at Marty and Leighton's. And so just invite people to that, mark that off. It uh, will be a great time. Just to give you a heads up, uh, we'll continue in Proverbs this Wednesday night. Man, we had a wonderful, great discussion last Wednesday. Uh, read Proverbs 26, chapter 26 to 30, and you'll be very wise this week. Uh, God bless you, and Pastor Mike is going to come with a call to worship. We're going to call the worship team forward. Stand with me. Hear the word of the Lord. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament 
with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord of the heavens and the earth, we come before you, <clears throat> seeking the unity that you have for the church, seeking the team that you are building for the church, Lord. As I heard a pastor's report from the UK, Lord, you love the church because it's your church. The Lord, you want the church to bloom, to flourish, to move in the unity that exists already between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You want us to jump into that holy dance of the Trinity. And we pray that the joy of the Lord will fill us to overflowing, that we will move in harmony with you, O Lord. We surrender this time together, O Lord, into your hands. We pray, Lord, for the preaching of your word on teamwork. We pray for the testimony of Edward and Malawi, O Lord. And we pray, O Lord, that we have our own testimony at the end of this day. As we meet with you, the God of heaven and earth, and the God who brings heaven to earth as we worship his holy name. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Good morning, folks. Good morning, friends. It is wonderful to have a testimony. We give all praise, honor, and glory to God. Uh, we welcome each and every one here this morning. I'm holding on my bus in your ears. We're in a little bit of a back here. Uh, but it is so good to be together in God's house. We're going to worship Him today. We have uh, lots of exciting stuff going on with Him sharing His story and all the all the uh, adventures that He's gone through. And, uh, and with themes, exactly, we encourage you to explore your talents. Um, and exactly, we go to the time of God and uh, uh, just explore your talents. We've got a uh, great master to work for. We're going to worship Him this morning. First song we're going to sing together is Jesus, Hold the Nation. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> I hope it's not going to be one of those days. <laughs> My excuse is we're looking out for the grandsons this weekend. We're looking out for the grandsons this weekend. Praise God. God is so good. How are God saved? Amen to that. In the 
uh, I just, you know, we're just so proud of Edward, and I think he's, you know, I was trying to think about this when we, everything was coming together for this Sunday, and I thought one of the beauties of what's going to happen in a moment was I remember uh, Edward coming back from one of his first mission trips, and he was just so excited, and he had found his place of service. He had found his place where it all came together for him, and it clicked, and it was exciting to see him find that place, and uh, I always shared that during the pandemic and no mission trips and things that changed from Haiti and all kinds of stuff, it's like, well, how now do I use this gift? And uh, we're just so excited today that we get to hear now the report of God provided exactly what he needed when he needed it. And he's representing today Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Canada. He's even got the t-shirt on, you'll see in a moment. And so that's a whole different arm of our missions, our global missions. And so, Edward, why don't you come on up if you're ready? And uh, he's going to share with us about his trip to Malawi. God bless you. Disaster relief missionary work, where if you have like a natural disaster and work has been done, 
Yes, I told you about it. And yes, the money is also involved. This trip in particular, what did I do? I built relationships. Amen. Amen. I built connections. Amen. I built trust with children. I built trust with people who I've never met. And maybe not see again. I possibly I will. But the other part of it was through discipleship, spending time with them, that's how you earn that trust. So I get it. Just because you didn't have a hammer in your hand doesn't mean you grew through. Sure. So anyhow, let's move forward. Let me get the pretty, pretty sharp. Um, this is my team. This is at Toronto International Airport. Um, probably around oh, about 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday. Uh, from left to right is the team leader, Alan. Alan is actually an NCM coordinator. Myself, of course. Next to myself is Stephanie. She's actually from the Red Deer area. Sammy from Winnipeg. Gail from Calgary. Vanessa from Montreal. And on the very far end is Nick Stoltz. Nick Stoltz is the MCN coordinator uh, for uh, Malawi and Kenya. Absolutely wonderful people. It was the first time we actually physically met um, with that morning, and we all basically became instant friends right out of the airport. Uh, flight was to Ethiopia at 10.20 a.m. Uh, sounds crazy, but of course you're at the airport early, so you get, of course, you're up at sunrise. However, less than 12 hours later, sunrise again. Sunrise again. <laughs> this is actually over the Red Sea, um, somewhere between uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but it was just such a beautiful sight on, you know, to see a second sunrise in less than 12 hours. Uh, of course, so let me just space myself down. Of course, it's Saturday, trying to get yourself together. Uh, Sunday morning, morning worship. It was also that important, but that was just beautiful. Uh, this is Andula. Andula is a boat. It is a community, probably about an hour's drive from the capital city of Malawi. And it's a south north boat, southwest. Uh, it's a boat. It's a boat. <laughs> and the roads are rough. Very rough. That's fine. Uh, that's quite all right. So Sunday morning we arrived, and of course as soon as you get there, uh, children are just losing it, of course, because they see the field, what we call Mizum. Mizum was because we respected a white person in Africa. So when we arrived, of course, they're chasing the truck and all excited to see us. Um, what we did find out earlier that morning, or sorry, um, once we arrived, the, the area is around takes the town about 10 kilometer radius in the middle of the world. And if you notice, it's a little bit hard to get, so we got a chart. Uh, there's about 400 children. Wow. And, about, and about half of them children have walked. Uh, I was just taking Spent the night at the church overnight so they could see us the next day. Um, it was quite, quite uh, humbling to see. Um, it was back in this little fellow in the blue shirt. I don't know if you can see him up there quite so. Uh, he was a little fellow. So I went out the truck. Of course, you're surrounded by kids, and they're all, you know, going crazy. And this little fellow in the blue shirt comes right up to me. Good morning. What's your name? And how are you? And I never did the purest English. And because English is not very well spoken in, in that area, I was just quite taken by that. He was as adorable as anything. Um, but kids are just so much fun. And of course, in, when you had that many people there, we had to, of course, have it outdoors. So we're taking attendance, and taking attendance is not like the clicker that either myself or Stephen has back there. Taking attendance is taking corn crumbs from one wall to another. Uh, and that morning after taking attendance, they had counted roughly about 612 people there at bus service. Service was about three and a half hours. Uh, it was hot. Uh, but it went by incredibly fast. There were singing, uh, there were testimonies, and just one of these little testimonies. I know I'm a little sporadic, but when you travel like this, you have hundreds of thoughts yeah. and memories, and you see a picture, and you will, you know, real, real, just sort of read kind of memory that you want to share about it. So if you're a little sporadic, and we are a little sporadic this morning, just give me a little bit of leeway if that's what happens. I uh, didn't have one lady got up that morning, and her, she was give praise to the Lord. Uh, normally we say, no, praise the Lord for, you know, help or, you know, I uh, got a prayer answer. Well, this lady got up and she said, I want to thank the Lord this morning. I had a giant poison snake in my house and nobody got hurt. Oh. And I'm like, <laughs> 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 I'm not going to your house. <laughs> you know? uh, but yeah, it, was, it, it, it actually took about two or three days just to really comprehend where you are. 
you know, like we come from North Carolina, you know, uh, it was my first time ever being in that area. I mean, we've done, you know, Haiti, we've been to the Dominican Republic or any of these places. When you're on the other side of the world, and in these cases, you're looking at the ground is the exact same color as the yeah, and gray soil. It feels the exact same. Of course, the surroundings are not the same, but it takes you a little just to realize I'm oh, not perfect. So, anyhow, uh, carrying on the middle of the day, of course, after service, we had lunch at the pastor's house, and the uh, pastor was his name, was Edward as well, but he was very, very excited. Uh, all the gospel that are out there, he was always, you know, this type of thing. And of course, after service, they had food here. We're going to feed the children. This is a group of ladies in the village. The gentleman in the white shirt is the uh, Malawian uh, NCM coordinator, who since to since the uh, sorry, super incredible human being, uh, son of a pastor. He's also an incredibly dry sense of humor. Uh, he was our driver and our tour guide for the entire week. Um, in those pots, you will see uh, there is actually a mustard, mustard leaf tomato mixture on one. Uh, and then a pot, a pot is called steema. Steema is actually a flower grain, sorry, flower taken from the milk form. And, and then the other one, I believe it was a chicken steema. We had to eat it. We tried it, I won't lie. The steam is horrible. <laughs> However, when you're at a pastor's house, they're serving you your best. Or sorry, they're serving you their best. You eat it. You, and you eat it and you smile. Most of it did actually taste good. It seemed like they didn't. I had a great time with it, but you, know, you eat it. And you smile. And you eat more. Because they serve huge portions of it. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, that time, of course, we're feeding the children. There's 300, well, over 350 children that day. Uh, the ladies came out with three pots. Like, the about, I'd say, one basket. I'd have to pull the basket size pots, right? Uh, one, of course, had everything that I just described. And there, there was no forks and knives. Everything stood up again. Ready to serve by hand. So, of course, myself, and then it's uh, Vanessa, and the, the, there's three or four of us. They say, No, if you want to serve, give us a boy's thumb and find a little bit of So, of course, they come out. The first thing they do is milk a small bottle, which is water. Wash your hands. No salt, no hand sanitizer, just wash your hands. Okay. So, of course, you have, you know, I've got a Sicilian children, and they're all right behind and all around you. And as you see them face, they all have plates, but not all of them have so after what they did, we feed some kids. Kids would go and wash their, wash their plate. And that's what kids do. And then that way. So now we look down at the pots and we're like, we got three kids. We don't have three pots. We got three kids. So I joked with the girls and I said, well, you know, what the Jesus did with loaves and fish. Right. So we said, grace over it and there'll be no money. Um, so after we said that about the pastor's house lunch, and I noticed these are pretty good with kids. These kids were a little bit further up in the village, probably about a half a kilometer a block away. So then, of course, they are noticing that there's some white people at the pastor's house. So, how many of them are that? So, anyhow, I said to the I said, you know, I said, let them after they lost a bit of left over, I said, why don't you go feed these kids? Of course. So, uh, please all be walk over and they're all just a little kind of freaky, a little scared, and uh, we bring up food. And all of a sudden, they all take off. Oh. Two seconds later, they all come out of that. I said, well, what did you do? So we won't wash our hands first. Because again, everything's all fit. Yeah. So afterwards, of course, we were walking back to uh, where, the, where the, the child or child development center was, and the kids were just behind you. And then you know, you're going to be all fashion behind you. So, of course, I was walking with Gail, who I introduced you up here. So, Gail and I were walking and you hear them. So, you'd be walking and walking and you'd hear them. And all of a sudden, people would just stop. And they'd hear them more. Okay. You guys are quiet. So, we walk a little further. And stop again. And stop. And start 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 you know, my turn around to talk about the kids, and the kids were just screaming their heads off and laughing, which was absolutely wonderful. Uh, Don't want their language. Yeah, but right. it's so easy to actually just take one question. They love to play. Uh, here we go. Here we go. So this is afterwards. We had a, uh, like, we played games with the kids. We had, you know, we sing with them. Uh, they are, well, that they get. Uh, 
and they sing at the top of the lungs. And we played this game called, you know, something like Sonic with this Jesus says. So we ended up probably about all of us in a circle. I lasted about probably three fourths of the game. And then I got to put it in the you know, because I wasn't listening to Jesus. It's game, right? So then I ended up with one of the teachers named Jeremiah. And I was very, very nice young man. He was one of the teachers at the child's child center. So then I started another game. And of course, when the game gets going, and you get louder, and more pitch. So the kids would get eliminated, they're all going to with us, and we'd start screaming. I do have videos of all some of this stuff. Of course, the kids put all up there. So if you ever want to see Luke, please come right over. It's the most adorable thing to watch them jump up and down and scream, and kids get yellow like children like that. Uh, this is the water well at uh, Anandula. That serves a water well that's one of the projects we're in the CN. Uh, there's also another one the next place I'm going to, go to share with you here in a few minutes. Um, and these are actually all, all throughout the community areas and are basically from some of the chronicles from the same Canada. So as you can see, this is a little girl. If you notice, none of the kids have long hair. Uh, that's the course petals. So they keep their head short, they help keep them clean. But of course, what I found with my experience of traveling over the last five or six years, children can be very easily intimidated. So the best thing you do is get down on one knee. And what that does is you the same. And the simplest way to actually be a child or anybody, especially a young one, simple fist bump, and they're excited that they just look at you and smile, you know, and you know that they you mean no harm to them. So that was Sunday. So Monday, Monday morning we got up, of course, beautiful sunrise in the lobby. It's just over the mountains, it's just unreal. And we headed north to Mazuzu. Mazuzu is a, another, uh, not quite a big, huge city, but it's north of Oslo. But it's about a five minute hour drive more. We stopped on the way. This is Elephant Rock. Elephant Rock is a very famous landmark in Malawi. Sorry, it's a little dim. It's hard to see, but that there's an elephant. Uh, there's an elephant that bears a plaque there. That's actually shaken. So after you Google it, you actually see Elephant Rock in Malawi. It will actually show you. It's a very impressive landmark. Um, then, of course, Tuesday. Tuesday morning we get up and we travel to Sukuma. Skum is a remote community, and when I mean remote, I mean remote. <laughs> Mizuzu is, or sorry, uh, Skum is a two and a half hour one way drive into the country northwest of Mizuzu. Dirt roads, rough dirt roads. And I mean rough, I mean rough dirt roads. Um, it's an incredible, incredible community. Um, as you can see, they have their own school. They have no church, and it's just amazing to see. They haven't had a video team in to visit them in about four years. We did it the first time. So for us to come in was a huge event. So Tuesday we land about late morning. Of course, school was completely shut down for the day, and they're all gathered around. Um, and of course, all the local tribal leaders and all the local tribes, anywhere from about, like I said, 10 to 12 kilometers away to be there. Um, so during the morning after we had, actually we'll go back very quick for this. Um, this is the ceremony that, that we had that morning. And in that ceremony, of course, they love your speeches. Every five leader is given the opportunity to welcome us. Uh, they also had some children come up. And the children would come up and of course were so shy that they were so horrible. So you would come up and they would recite Bibles, or sorry, Bible verses, and they would stand there. They'd look up. And they run up, boom. And then maybe whoever tribe they belong to, their tribe leader, would give them a gift for being out there. Uh, we have one little boy from up, and he actually come up and he had, it's a, I don't even know, there was like a metal uh, sash around his waist, and of course it put his bongo drums, and he would make this dance in order to go about that, in order to uh, just perform for them. The one interesting part, um, there is a video of this too, but I didn't post it up here, uh, there was a tribe called the Mazuzu tribe. That's, uh, yeah, no, the Mugandu tribe. And the Mugandu tribe had a age group of five, five young men, about 20 years old, and they performed twice, of course, for that same bongo drum. And it was quite impressive to see, to see that, a real tribal dance. But what's most interesting part, and this was actually one of my cool moments of the trip, they came up and asked me to join me. And my first instinct, of course, there's still probably 700 people. Oh, geez, 
Heaven is on. Hit me very quick. Just down. Go. Let go. You don't enjoy that moment. And it was probably one of those three moments in my entire trip. You say, I never quit. The moment I stepped off, I said, because we're all sitting in class and the platform, we see all those children, and we're all lined up there. I got up off that platform, and I stood down. The moment I got up on my foot, my foot went on the ground. I heard more children screaming and laughing, and they were just beyond the excitement. And I tried, of course, dance. Try <laughs> Uh, it's not a crazy task, it was I knew it was a crazy task, it was actually kind of crazy. It is like this. I laughed at myself and I said, well, I'm going to make a full myself, I'm going to make a full myself. They had never seen me before, and maybe they should see me again. But the real special part of it was afterwards, it was uh, the leader of the tribe. He came right up, right up to me, right close, grabbed my hand, and he put the money in my hand. Now, he gave me what I call it out, a thousand kwasha. Kwasha is the, is the Malawian um, currency. And a thousand kwasha is basically right there. You expect it. It's 50 cents US. Like, not a lot of money. But the look on his face, he was so grateful. He said, This is for you. This is for you. He said, Thank you for being part of my tribe. That is a memory that I still will never ever forget. Because it, it wasn't the money, we needed the money. I mean, oh, I didn't need the money. You like this, but you need some money more than I do. You know, but the gift, the gift, the gift of you participating in my trial. And the look on his face was the absolute most sincere and just the most kindest expression I've ever seen. That it was when I turned out, no, of course I would never be here, but it just really struck me really, really well, really hard. Uh, later on in that day, of course, we drew around the, the area. Uh, agriculture is actually quite huge in um, in Malawi. Eighty percent of uh, of the land is actually used for agriculture up in the Zulu. Uh, the main grains is corn or maize, as they call it. Uh, up course, in, in Dula, and Dula, if I could just show you there, uh, it's also very interesting. It's tobacco. Tobacco is actually grown in Japanese, and that's really nice to learn about a lot of Malawi. Um, a lot of these big, whether they're plantations or businesses, banks, are all foreign gold. Banks and businesses are usually almost South Africa, uh, with big crops. Uh, like I said, South Africa is Japan, which was quite interesting. The other thing that actually would Alan would make is, sorry, we shouldn't say make us ask us if we would do. Uh, we actually went around and interviewed people. Um, I'll get to mine very shortly. So uh, but at the end of it, we try your best. Um, as you see, one of the big things is called ag or, sorry, uh, conservation agriculture. This is a concept basically introduced to Milan, or sorry, uh, Mizuku, sorry, Zukuma. Um, anyhow, um, conservation agriculture is basically getting better yield from your Everything is done by hand. There's no oxen with the plow. There is no tractor. They accepted this idea completely on the base. Most of it started on with, like I said, a 20 meter by 20 meter plot or 60 by 60 plot. And one thing I did is to have compost and then better because there's very little nutrients in the actual land And use a, um, and add other plants, or sorry, other um, crops, or mixture crops together. So in this case, this lady, she was one of them. Uh, she had what I call maize or corn, and she had beans mixed in with that. And we actually seen probably about four different plots for people. And they love, they love to talk about their, their accomplishments and they're very, very proud of that. As you can see, this is a handmade silo. So this is actually owned by one of the uh, one of the farmers at Sakuma. He was actually what they call the big farm. Or the Rennies, where maybe the green color of the pattern. he was very, very kind man. Uh, he started up with a 60 by 60 plot the first year. Last year he had one and a half acres. And he went from starting out with just maize and beans to uh, maize, beans, corn, sorry, uh, sweet potato, and there was another vegetable that he had mixed in with it. Uh, this is 
him right there with his two or his three grandchildren. Um, as you see behind him, if you can see that quite well, uh, this little shop right behind is actually for housing goats. He had two goats. Uh, and he tells you that the way it was, the structure was um, designed so that way if manure from the goats would drop, he would use that as compost. He also had an elevator, of course, because of the global wildlife. Uh, hyenas are known for the area, so of course you want to protect them from any possible predators. This area actually is a maize mill, um, what they do, or a grinder. Once they pick, well, once they pick the kennel or the kernels off the maize, they grind it down into a very fine powder. Uh, the interesting thing is, thing about actually, and I think we're going to understand why, but when they grind it down, they actually will strip the nutrients. When they eat that, when they make that, when they make what they call semen. If it's done without being, I would say, stripped of the nutrients, it's more yellow. Uh, but they, they, they prefer it more white. White has very, no nutritional value to it, but it's very filling. Um, that's what just, I don't know, that's they like to eat it. Um, so this is just the entry going into the school. Of course, after a two and a half hour drive, we're still driving 2.9 kilometers into even more remote roads. Uh, and the other thing we had to really watch for, we had to watch the sky. Because the thing is, it started raining and getting out of it. So we had to make sure that there was any possibility of any rain coming. We had to make sure that we were there for nine years before they put them up to nothing near their house. Of course, there's medical services at Zakuma. There is actually a government employee on staff who actually lives there. Uh, there's no electricity grid. There is um, no cell service. However, uh, he does have solar panels to help him get any medication um, in the freezer. He's got a big phone and keep that cool. But if there is an emergency, we do have an ambulance. Um, it was quite interesting. Uh, this is actually their school. This is actually, they teach up to grade eight. Uh, once, once, uh, one teacher per, per grade. Classes are anywhere for, I think it was grade eight, had 74 kids in one classroom. Grade six had 62. Um, single room classroom, and they teach everything. Um, like I said earlier, I had the opportunity to actually uh, interview teachers. And I said, no, what's your easy subject to teach? She said, no, 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 it was pretty easy. She said, my easy subject is agriculture. I said, what's your most difficult subject to teach? And she said, science. I said, you think so fun? She said, I had no resources to show anything. Every year, I had nothing to show them. Um, each year to come, the Zakuma receives the equivalent of $65 US from the government for resources. This is for chalk, paper, um, board erasers, you name it. $65 US is what they get. So, as when you see, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been on the NCM Canada website, they ask if you want to sponsor a child or anything like that. I see why they need money, and I see where it goes. Um, as we go on, this is just another view of their classroom. Um, I said they're very, very minimum. So they have two chalkboards, um, but the kids all agree they respect their teacher quite well. Education is incredibly important to them. The only downside, and this was something that really hit me at a very, a very <laughs> minor in the way back, uh, after they reach grade 8, there isn't any high school. It's also very, it's also, especially for the young boys and the young men. That was one thing I didn't notice in that period. A lot of young men who live high on climate do not go. So, there's a possibility, there is, there is discussion of vocational training for these boys, which would either be in masonry, carpentry, uh, just give them life, a little bit of life skills instead of after grade eight. Basically, just simple farming or doing something. Um, there is a sewing program for the girls, but it's only something that can get into that because you don't look at too many people in it, but there is, that is a way of generating income for themselves. Um, this is just a quick couple quick pictures of the kids. They, they just love having us there. And of course, as you see, that's where we sat. And surprisingly, it's about 38 degrees where we're sitting. So it's hot, it's incredibly hot out there in the, um, in the middle of the afternoon. So, as you can see, all homes are made of brick. These bricks are all handmade and hand cooked, right? and the inner brick oven, and it actually is also handmade, um, which was actually very interesting. Uh, the roof could be either 
steel, uh, if you have a man like steel, or in most of you will be less, you can have a period of long that like that thatched, uh, that thatched roof, uh, which is quite interesting. So if you have heavy rains, you can actually walk them through that. Uh, this is actually the district DS's, uh, he was like, traveling with us behind us, and she was with tractor problems we had, we had the educational herd would come through. Uh, never saw a single, never saw a single time so long, unfortunately. Hopefully not. Well, it happens. Um, but it's these are the roads. And that's a good one. And that's a, and that's a past year period, it's a really good one. Uh, that's just a mountain view, if you're looking towards, uh, of course, uh, the mountain range through the Mount Malawi, coming back from the, from the on our way home. Uh, and again, like I said, that's a good road. So I know you'll be driving no more than five kilometers an hour at some point. And you can actually be able to watch the rock. Um, so that was two days in Sukuma. Uh, and we got a question on Thursday. Thursday, we actually started our way home, or sorry, our way back to Lanai, into the capital city. This is actually a rubber tree plantation. We stopped up on the way through. It was just absolutely stunning. Uh, rubber, and actually, they even picked sap from the actual trees to make rubber, whether it could be for shoes, um, for tires, whatever it is. Uh, so we did spend about probably about half an hour there. These are just the trees. The trees are all perfectly planted. Which actually, this one in particular is owned by Ethiopians. Um, like I said, a lot of foreign uh, foreign ownership in the in Malawi. The interesting part was we actually met two. Uh, one of them was working, uh, and it was about five thousand people. And and um, of course, if, everybody, if you live on there, you knew that there was child child labor. Um, this is a few quick pics of us just having some fun there. Uh, later on, we, did, we got to actually see the actual Lake Malawi. Lake Malawi is actually the fourth largest lake in the world uh, by volume in the area. You walk in there, it looks just like a Caribbean island. It was absolutely stunning. Um, it was actually just beyond beautiful. Of course, you go swimming at night because that's what the real life is. This would just talk about the pond was just whatever else is in there. So, of course, we didn't win the water was rubbing. Um, this is some cute scenery from across. And on Friday, we would see the, um, the office for in Canada. This is actually at the uh, local pastor, or the DS's, on his property. As you see, shipping container that's just been simply converted into an office space for the time being. Uh, this is a cute picture of his property. Actually, that's actually just church and Nazareth. That's actually all uh, broom bushes. Um, as we can announce, and also on Friday, we did buy a little bit of a run city. Like I said, we're in the city of 2 million people. Uh, English is well spoken. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, a lot of Muslim, uh, not radical, just simply, but there's a very interesting uh, combination of faith. Um, if you notice, this is a new highway structure that's being built, but if you notice, there's not one bulldozer, excavator, nothing. This is all done by hand. Um, that's just a very good, quick mosque in the downtown district area. The interesting thing I like about Malawi, everything's for sale. Everything. And I mean everything. Um, it's a daily cash society. So whatever you sell that day, you make money that day, so you buy the beef that day. Uh, this is the people be caught in traffic. They'll be able to sell you a blanket. They'll sell you a towel, t-shirt, bottle of water. Uh, some people had live chickens, or better legs, <laughs> that supper, you know. Uh, actually, male chickens are going to get more money than the female chickens, but they're thicker. Uh, if you need, you need to go to rooms, so they'll help you go out of the side of the you buy a casket, flower arrangements, whatever you need. The other interesting thing was the furniture. Um, and very briefly, uh, we actually see the group of scientists in Malawi. They drove one of the most beautiful handmade leather furniture I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we also got to see the National Campus, very right southern Malawi, about a half an hour drive. Again, we're but that's okay. Uh, we also got to see a, um, a local chicken farm, which is also one of the main NCM projects. And again, this is done through Food and Fashion Ministries. And of course, what do they do with them? Of course, the side of the road, sell them tickets. And of course, you kind of have a little bit of fun and stuff like that. They go out the markets. Uh, people in the markets are very, very friendly and very respectful. Um, a little pushy, just like any results. Um, actually, I did bring some stuff in this morning if you wanted to look at the back table on the video. Uh, and there's also some paintings. It's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, ending with wood is mostly done by teak, and everything is hand carved. And some of it is actually initial or inside out. And of course, on our way uh, this, is, this is fine with the Congo. Uh, we stopped in the Lubashi for a quick minute, but it was eight inches to look down, and all you see is jungle, you see rivers. 
uh, they have a developing agency with mines. In the town of mines, I have a lot of mining, it's huge. About 60% of the world's cobalt for electric vehicles is mined in, uh, in the Congo, as well as diamonds, copper, and other precious minerals. But it's also very well known for child labor. Uh, this is Bowdoin International, that is out of uh, uh, just best stuff in the world. It's <laughs> Ethiopian coffee, I got like to say. Ethiopian Airlines is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's 13 hours uh, from Ethiopia to Toronto. It went by uh, quite quick, and they treat you like royalty, even though you're even a year ago, you're in a economy class. And that is us. Uh, as we're on the way, um, excuse me, at the Long Beach International, we're getting ready to fly in. Uh, quick note, we'll be down the on the very far right. That is, his name is Pat, so he's actually Chinchin's his nephew. He was actually, um, we cut him for the week, because um, what they wanted to do, instead of always going to have yourself, I'm going to take a picture of this picture up to that. He was hired to be our photographer, so he could capture the moments. Instead of us trying every hour or all seven or eight of us trying to capture the moment, that's all he did all week. An incredible young man, very, very kind of young And that's the end basically of our trip. Um, but before I leave, I just want to say um, thank you, everyone. I want to thank you for praying for us while we're traveling. I want to thank my pastors for one introducing this trip for me. Hope it's not my last. Uh, it could be, I don't know. Uh, we'll see how, to, uh, how the time goes. I want to thank my wife and my children. Uh, respect these trips, are, or, sorry, these trips are not cheap to go. Uh, they're sacrifices, they make sacrifices, I make sacrifices. Um, but they're always been there to support for every time I've ever gone, regardless of where I went, they've always sacrificed, and they've always supported everything I've done. And I would just like to thank my congregation, like for your prayers, your thanks, uh, your interest. I mean, I really love food. I never thought I would ever, you know, five or six years ago, someone would said to me, you know, you're going to be traveling the world, playing with kids, feeding, you know, feeding the hungry, feeding children on the streets, um, you know, dancing with a tribe of people. No, I don't know. 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 It's amazing what God can do in your life when you just say yes. And it's amazing what can happen and how big things when God is in it. And thank you. Amen. Ooh. Just a few points about tea, and uh, I just want to have a word of prayer for our missions. And Lord, we just thank you for the work you're doing around the globe today on behalf of missions. We we give you the praise and glory, Lord, that the Church of the Nazarene has had its heart with missions right at its inception. We thank you for all the different branches of our uh, Nazarene Missions International. We thank you for. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. We thank you that Canada has its own branch of that and that Edward was able to go. We pray uh, for that continued work there in Malawi, but that is just one country where the projects are. Thank you, Lord, that we have been able to bring missions home through Edward and to be able to see it through his eyes, and it is alive and well. And so, Lord, uh, we just pray that you would continue to bless Edward and as he shares this with others in days ahead, that you would stir something up in the hearts of those who are called to missions, O oh God. Help us all to do our part, Lord, we pray. And thank you for the reality of this. And we pray your continued blessing on global missions. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're singing a transitional song. Figured it'd be good to get you up on your feet.
brings us back to the reality of why we do what we do, right? And why Malawi and CM does what they do. They do it because of Jesus. One, because we are doing missions here, wanted to give you a quick update of where we are. And so in the Church of the Nazarene, every church around the globe is given a budget. And uh, a budget to raise money for missions. So even those churches, as we heard, that their money doesn't seem to mean much, 50 cents American. Uh, but it is part of our church's DNA that every church, every organized church, uh, is contributing to world missions. And so that's what this goal, this budget is about. And one of the beautiful things about the Church of the Nazarene, and I've seen it many, many years with missionaries, uh, our missionaries are well taken care of. And so they don't have to spend a lot of their energy in raising funds and coming home and waiting until they have enough funds to be able to go. They are there. They do what they need to do, and we do what we need to do, and that is to support them. And so that's what this goal, Faith Promise, is all about this year. Why do we do this? This is our church has been challenged to give 5.5% is the minimum that we give of all that we raise, we send it to missions. And so something exciting just happened. We put slides up about it. We've moved into a new world area. We've moved into Belgium. And where the money comes from moving into a new nation and a new country is if we overpay this. That overpayment of our budget actually goes to open up new work. And we've seen it happen just within a few months. They've gone down to the country of Belgium, the Church of the Nazarene. That's something exciting when you think about it. And there'll be missionaries that will have to do that work, go into a brand new country, and, and with the gospel of Christ. So uh, we projected 13,000, and praise God, here's a good problem to have. Carol says that our, 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 our giving is so good, we might have to make even more than 13,000. Uh, that's a projected budget, so you know the Lord can help us to do that. We had 3,000, over 3,000 come in for our Thanksgiving offering. World Evangelism Fund is the WEF. And so we're challenging you that we would love to be able to raise above and beyond our normal tithes. We would love to get 3,000 or more in for our Easter offering. That's still going to mean that we need to raise, you know, $3,370. Who would give the five cents? And five cents uh, by the end of April. Like today. Yeah. So with God's help, uh, I'm just putting that out there. The board has asked me to take this on and do the... The promo of this and missions is something that I am passionate about. I don't have a problem. Uh, links missionaries. This is something that just for those that are not aware, we used to do this quite a bit and then things kind of slid a little bit and now the district has brought this to our attention again. What is links missionaries? Link missionaries are what we're saying is loving, interested, Nazarenes, knowing, and sharing. And so what it is is every district is assigned a missionary to befriend and pray for. And these are our new missionaries uh, that uh, we got from the district office. And so this is uh, Jimmy and Elizabeth de Guave, I think it's Guavilla, from Colombia. And so you will have opportunities to pray for them. Uh, and remember, you can write a card, you can write a note, we can do a little, raise some money and send them a little gift for a birthday or an anniversary. There's lots of ways that, but there is going to be, there's information up on the bulletin board. If you wanted just a, a, a Bible study group or a Sunday school class, wanted to get a little note together and send it to them, that would mean so much to them to get that, uh, that new, and you know, the best thing you can do for any missionary is pray for them. Pray for their work. We're back today on to team. Teamwork. And so that's something that we're just going to look at very quickly today. And I love this story, and you'll get the point. I read a story somewhere about two men working on the side of the road in a certain town. And a woman was sitting on her front porch, watched them in amazement. One man dug a hole, and the second man filled it up. They moved down the street a few feet, and the first man dug a hole. The other man filled it up. And they did that about three times. <laughs> Like any woman, nosy woman, she said, pardon me, she went down the street to talk to these men. Pardon me, but one of you digs the hole and the other fills it up. Then she asked, what exactly are you doing? One of the men said, well, we are on the city's beautification team. And we are up here to plant some trees and make the town look better. The lady said, 
But you just dig holes and fill them up. The other man said, oh, I can explain. You see, one of us is the digger and the other one is the filler. But the guy who <laughs> puts the trees in the hole, he's out sick today. <laughs> Now, why do I tell that story? If we're not careful, that's the church. We can be so busy working. If people aren't doing their part, it's like we're digging holes and filling them up, but we're not planting any trees. And so it's important that every person is important to the kingdom of God. And so we're looking at this theme again that we did a while back. Team, together, everyone achieves more. That's really what... Uh, the kingdom of God is about. Our passage today is just one verse. We didn't have it read before because we're just looking at it very quickly right now. And it's 1 Peter 4.10 that each, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And I'm so uh, proud of Edward finding that place of gifting and using it. As they, look how excited he is. Because when you're using your gift for God in his kingdom, it is work, it is costly, but it is also very exciting. And so we see that the Lord has determined teamwork. This is something God created, not us, uh, right here today. And uh, I'm going to ask if Leah would come and help me with something. i got a gift for you. And so we see that we're told that God has given each one of us a gift. And I want you to open up this gift in front of everybody and hold up the things. You, you, and that's yours to keep after. You'll, you'll be thankful that you came forward in a moment. Ooh, now you, I can see Dad already. Jelly beans? Well, you know what happens when you eat jelly beans. So, there's two other items in there. There's what? Toothpaste and a toothbrush. Toothpaste and a toothbrush. You can take that gift with you. Uh, yeah, and, and the reason why I have the, this, it was supposed to be a power toothbrush, but unfortunately, honey, you got to use your own power. I couldn't get one in time. And, and the idea of is, you know, you look at a power toothbrush and you use it, if you were told by the dentist, use it two minutes in the morning, use your power toothbrush two minutes at night, you know, and then when you don't realize it, that adds up to two hours a month. And if you do that faithfully every day, that adds up to 24 hours in a year. Now, I doubt that we would spend a whole day brushing our teeth. But what we do is we do a little bit here and a little bit there every day. And those little things begin to add up and make a great difference. It is those small, consistent acts that makes a difference in the kingdom of God. It doesn't have to be a big act. It can be those smaller things where you're participating. Sometimes we can all feel small. Sometimes we can feel, I don't have great gifts. I can't get on a plane and go all the way to Malawi. I can't get up and preach a message. So what can I do? And I want to encourage you today. It's those small, consistent acts that have a great impact in the kingdom of God. I love that statement. Little is much when God is in it. And so we see that God has determined teamwork. He has given every believer, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you have accepted Christ, you cannot accept Christ without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gifts every believer with a gift to use for him and his kingdom. And all of it begins to add up and make a difference. Interesting enough here, the word that is used here in 1 Peter uh, is a word that there are about nine words uh, that actually are different words, like, like love in Greek, it's got all kinds of words. Gifts have nine different words in the Greek New Testament. But there are usually three mean meanings for the word gift. And, and one is a present, like I just gave. That's, that's usually what we think when we hear gift. Um, and we talked about giving a mission offering above our ties. That's a gift. But the word that's used here is the word endowment. Now, that's a word not everyone knows, especially if English is your second language. It means empowerment. So God has given us the gift, the Holy Spirit. He has empowered everyone to do something 
for the kingdom of God. He's empowered us to do something for the church here. There's somehow we can get involved and make a difference. And the church needs every gift that we have, or we are just being busy digging holes and filling them, but we're not planting any trees. That's that passage at the beginning that Pastor Mike read from Ephesians. Every gift that we have, no matter how small it is, just like brushing your teeth faithfully every day, can have a great impact. And every small act of kindness done through Christ in this church adds up to something. We can see also that you're to use your gift how? You're to use your gift to serve. And so we see that the Lord himself demonstrated teamwork. We know that he called 12 disciples. We know that he returned to the Father. And those 12 disciples were to go out now as the gospel spread. We are all the hands and feet of Jesus. We are to go now and do his work. But we also see Christ as our example of service. What did he say? I came to what? Serve and not be served. You know, we're to take on that spirit of humility that we hear in Philippians 2, right? Verses 5 to 8, that Christ, though being God, pushed aside his divinity and chose to come and to serve us. I have that picture there as we move into Holy Week. One of the greatest acts of service we will ever read in God's word was the washing of his disciples' feet. And he said to them, as I am your master and Lord, and I do this, I expect you to go and do the same. So we're a part of a team, and God is expecting us. He's demonstrated it for us, and now he expects us to take on that attitude of service. Now that's really making me feel old, because I realized it's 1979 that this song came out by... Bob Dylan. But Bob Dylan said it quite well. He says, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. <coughs> so the question today is, who are you serving? You see, no one is called into a local church to sit and watch. There is no spiritual gift called sitting. There is no spiritual uh, gift called watching. There is no spiritual gift called receiving. <laughs> there is something that all of us can do. It's a sad thing that we say this repeatedly, that 20%, 80% rule. And it's, it's not just our church, it's across North America, right? 20% of those in the church do 80% of the work. And so it's not, that is not God's design. That is what we've settled for. But that is not what God would have for us. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Often when we think stewardship, we think it's money. We think that's what it is. And of course, money is so close to us that we often realize that stewardship, good stewardship means what we do with our money. But it's also what we do with our time, our talent, and our treasure. That that is also a form of stewardship. We're to be faithful stewards with everything that God has given us because of his grace. And it's intended to be used for his purpose. And to fail to use God's gifts is also bad, poor stewardship. And so, you know, we used to joke and say, well, if you've been given it, gifted it, use it, or you will lose it. Now, do we have it all figured out when we try to step out and do something for God in this church, in this kingdom? No. We learn as we go. But if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Peter, previous to this passage, reminded his readers that you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. You have spent enough time serving the devil and the world and worldly schemes. Now that you're in Christ, wouldn't it make sense to use your gifts and your blessings and your stewardship to serve his kingdom? I don't know when you came to faith. I know some people don't come to faith until later in life. Some come to faith younger in the journey. But isn't it important to take our gifts and what the time we have left and use it instead of serving the world like we did in our past? Now it's time to serve Christ in new and fresh ways. Do you know, I hear a lot of 
excuses over the years, and I'm just being frank here. I'll tell you one thing. We're all given the same hours a day, and we're all given the same days a week. And how you use that time is between you and the Lord. But how you use that time can make a difference for eternity in someone's life. Now I'm talking about big actions. Remember? Two minutes in the morning, two minutes at night. Adds up to 24 hours in a year. That's something as simple as brushing your teeth. What if little acts of kindness would be done in the name of the Lord? You don't know what God can do with that. And so, to bring this to a close, you know why teamwork? The Lord delights in teamwork. He loves when we're working as a team. He loves to bless us when we're working in unity for his kingdom and his cause. And we know that because of that familiar, wonderful song. All the way back in one Psalm 133, we read, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard, beard of Aaron, running down on the edges of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. There is this beauty of seeing the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of God upon us, when we're being used by God. I had almost the exact same experience as Edward dancing with the Cubans after a district assembly one night, and the ones down at the east, the whole whole game group came in, and we as the Canadians had to wait to get our bus back home to the hotel. Pastor Mike went on ahead in the first bus load. I stayed, and you could hear them coming down through in Cuba, all these guys coming, and they were playing machetes, and they had a saw, and they, were, they could just grab whatever they could, and they made it into, and then all of a sudden, I'll never forget it, we got there in that little cantina area, and they were dancing on to the Lord, and they were singing, and they grabbed me and a few others, and we were dancing too. And I had somebody say something to me, which was the most powerful thing I've ever had. You are a Cuban, Betty, you are a Cuban. In Spanish, they said to me, because I got there and I danced with them. Edward heard, you are our tribe. You're a part of our tribe. It's that willingness to show this, this unity and this blessing and to use whatever gifts God has given you, that you get this sense of God's blessing, of God's delight, and God's favor upon us. Do you know what? Unity attracts people. We have a group of people today outside this church that is looking for an alternative community, a place where it's different than what they see in the world. And when we move in unity, when we work as a team, when we use our gifts for God, God begins to pour down his blessing upon us. That becomes attractive to those on the other side of the church. If we work in disunity and uh, unforgiveness and judgmental and complaining, well, that just, that just usually repels people and drives them in the opposite direction. And so, gifts, we like receiving gifts, don't we? Uh, we, we? We like receiving gifts. We like, I'm going to ask Leah to come back. We, we like receiving gifts, and, and, and some of us like giving gifts. Some are not so good at that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, yeah, we love opening gifts, but I want to challenge you. There, Let's see if that'll stay on there because I didn't want. Here's the challenge: each one of us has been given gifts to what? Be the gift. Look at someone and say, "Be the gift." Be the gift. Be the gift. Right. And maybe we should appreciate each other in the church more and say, you are a gift. Maybe say that to somebody. You are a gift. You just remind everybody of that today, right? Everyone you see, you'll say, I'm a gift. I'm a gift. Be the gift. I want to challenge you. We need your gifts here in the church. We always have. We always will. There'll never come a point where the church doesn't need you and doesn't need your gift. 
and not one person in this church is more important than someone else. It doesn't matter if you're on the platform or you play an instrument or you're in the back room working with kids. We're all important in God's kingdom. Uh, we have, as you leave today, we have uh, Edward will be out in the back in the foyer and you can talk to him about the mission trip. We don't right now have a mission ministry team, but we would love to put one together if you're interested in local missions and global missions. It's time to put a team together for that. We're in process with this. So right behind these middle pews is a list there that if you feel and you say, Pastor, what you're going to share now doesn't meet my gift things, but I, I have this gift, and you want to write on that piece of paper is there right behind Edith, you can write down some other ideas and some other concepts. We, we have no problem. Our trustees would love to have a group they can call upon. Our stewards would love to have a group they can call upon. So, you know, don't feel. Remember, we're talking about these are ministry gifts. This is what God has given you and blessed you with. We're praying with you. We're going to work on this together. The church is not done yet with these teams. But there are some teams today that we want to uh, and, uh, challenge you with that if you're feeling led to that. Now, hear me right. Someone asked me before the service, Pastor, I already gave my name for that team. Should I sign up again? And I'm saying to you, yes, because we're trying to get these lists now compiled and put them to paper and uh, distributed in the church. So, uh, Margie and, and Joanne have been doing a visitation ministry, and they've been starting to visit. And there's people in our church who have always visited. We're making it now intentional. And Margie will be there, and if you're, you feel that maybe God's calling you to uh, take some time throughout your week and visit a few, drop in on a few people, and visit on behalf of the church, that's possible. Uh, hospitality and outreach are kind of combined a bit, and Leanne is not able to be here today, but Ruthie is part of that team, and they're planning big events that we have that will build up the fellowship of our church, the community of our church, but also something you can invite others into if you want, if you're thinking about that. A grief benevolence. Bev has stepped into this wonderful ministry. We saw it in action yesterday. What a blessing. And what a, a way to communicate the love of our church to those who are hurting and grieving. Bev doesn't need to just kind of put it out there and wonder who, who's going to be there. We need to get a team in place with Bev that sees this as our ministry pastor. We want to be a part of that. Bev, we want to be a part of that. You know that we'll come and we'll be a part of that. So uh, let's see Bev and sign up for that. It's, it's doing uh, refreshments after a funeral, but it's also ministering to the grieving, dropping by, dropping a tray of food off sometimes to people. There's a lot that could be done and developed in that area. Uh, pastor Taberly mentioned to me, Pastor, we need substitute teachers in Sunday school. We need children's workers. And so um, Rachel is going to help there. And if you want to talk to Rachel and sign up, there's training that's necessary. There's junior church. There's Sunday school. There's Kids Connection on Wednesday night. Maybe you can only commit one week of the year, and that would be part of, to be part of Vacation Bible School. We'd love to hear from you. And then Janet is stepping in for us today on the worship ministries of our church. And uh, we pr they provide the worship. It's, it's a ministry. It's not just playing an instrument. It's a ministry of prayer. It's a ministry of bringing us into the presence of God. But if you play an instrument, if you want to help Edward in the back in the tech, and you maybe you're a very techie person, whatever that is, we say amen to it. We'd love to come alongside you and help you and find that place for you. So, I say all that to say, if any of those areas are somewhere you want to explore more, we're not saying you got it all nailed down, as you leave today, we're going to now invite the worship team to come. I'm going to sing our closing song, and I'm going to ask those individuals that are going to be behind the table if you would step out towards the end of the song and be ready, so that when people leave today and they want to converse more with you, if they want to sign up somewhere, uh, we encourage you to already be back there ready to talk to the people. And so together, with God's help, we're going to find that place of ministry for all of us. And some of us can commit more time in a week, and some of us can't. And that's okay. We're saying that's the whole point about team. We're asking God, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? 
We're not comparing ourselves to anyone else. It's us, between us and God. What could I do that could make a difference for the kingdom of God right here at the Elmsville Church of the Nazarene? Father, it's been a good Sunday in the house of the Lord. We're so excited about what you've done in Edward's heart and life. And we're so excited to hear missions is alive and well. And Lord, I thank you for every ministry of our church. We take it for granted coming into worship week after week that those who lead us into the presence of God. We thank you, Lord, for the children's ministry of our church. There's just so many opportunities and we're, we're only scratching the surface. And so, Father, would you just take all of it and may it, you take it all as we'll see in a moment, Lord. We love you today, Lord, and it is a joy and a privilege to serve you in your church. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Direct our paths, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is our new Lent song. Stand with us as we sing it.